Okay, hello folks. It is April 10th, 2023. And um, I've had a few changes happening in my life, uh, personal in personal life. And um, the Zoom meetings that I have been a part of have drastically changed in that they're not going to be happening the same as they were. Um, several people have not been able to carry on in the same format as before. And I have been called up to continue to lead these teachings, which the Lord has been working with me for quite some time anyway, um, plugging away at these teachings. So I don't think that's an issue whatsoever, but the format is going to change because if I'm going to be leading it with God and responsible for his children, then we are going to do it according to the ministry that he has assigned me to and the ministry that he has assigned me to is to the full body of Christ, meaning not just um, a, a specific segment of his, his body, um, meaning baby Christians, as in people who barely know anything about God, likely are not living with God in all the ways that they're supposed to yet and don't really have too much intimacy with him to those that are very much walking with God can hear from him and see in the spirit realm and conduct life properly with God because there's everyone on the spectrum. The, the spectrum is the path or the walk with God. And I, I nor God want to leave anybody behind or not be fed. So some of these teachings will be over people's heads a little bit and some will be rudimentary to other people. Um, but I believe everyone is going to be able to be fed of something in these teachings that God wants to do. And that that's the point and premise here is that I, I want to be clear that these Zoom meetings are going to be teachings. It's not just a whole bunch of people getting together for the sake of fellowshipping alone. It will be regarding the topics that are being taught by the Lord because these are the things that are on his heart because they are timely, uh, meaning appropriate for what is happening and what he is seeing and what's going on in his very own body, which is his believers, which is, is, is literally supposed to be his body as he's the head. So his body is very sick and unlearned and undisciplined. And that's the topic that he's been on lately. Now I know a lot of people are going to see this on YouTube, but if you do not come to my Facebook right now, you will not get the link. I cannot give this Zoom meeting link to everyone under the sun. There is a limited amount of people that can attend these things. And so you will have to come to my Facebook to get the links. And they're going to be right now at different times because uh, I'm not sure what's going to work best for everyone because everybody has a different idea and schedule. And so we're going to leave it tentative um, and set up in advance. I will set them up in advance a couple of days or so or a few days or so before the meetings. Um, but they're, I'm going to feel it out with God right now and not be too concerned about nailing something down or on a consistent basis right yet. Um, so that is the plan with these Zoom meetings, but they are going to be recorded because people are going to be able to learn from these teachings in general for quite some time on the playback to um, YouTube. But it, but like I said, this is this is all preliminary. It's tentative right now, and we're going to figure this out. Having said that, the topic that God has been on is dis discipline and being a disciple. What is this? What is a child of God in general? What do they look like, and what ought they be operating like? And who is God? Do we even know God and what He said in Scripture? Right. Because we have a lot of religion out there and religion saves no one. Nowhere in the scripture does it tell people that religion saves anyone. Religion is a construct of a whole bunch of rules and operations and structure. None of that has anything to do with the living God himself. And folks, 
I would like to share, just to be clear, if we didn't even have a Bible, we could still know the living God if you actually reached out to him in truth from your hearts. Because before there was ever a written word in, in Bible, 66 Bible books, the library of Bible books, before that, there were scrolls and tablets. And before that, there was God communing with his children one-on-one. -on -one. So we have got to know the living God for real and be in covenant marriage with him. And you can't be in a covenant marriage cheating on him. It doesn't work that way. That's called hypocrisy. It's called lukewarm. And in the end, those get vomited out because he said, we never knew each other in a faithful relationship. So what he has me on now is he would like for me to, we will still be doing obedience and discipline or and or disobedience and lack of discipline for the unforeseeable amount of future time because it's always been on his heart i mean when yeshua walked the earth god himself incarnate in a flesh that is what he taught repent for the kingdom of god is nigh like it's here right now unto you and um you ain't living right with god and we need to train you up in some schooling so that you can, so that you're not one that he says, depart from me, because you would not live my way with me in a faithful marriage covenant. You would just would not be seated in my ways. You were seated in the other guy's ways or Satan's fallen ways. So he will be teaching on this for quite some time. Because we are in a time period, especially now where we're in a great falling away from true faith true worship of god which means literally himself and people are walking and talking however they want purporting and saying everything with their lips but they really ain't living it and he's seeing it all so in this great falling away if ever there was a time to really push on discipline being a disciple and seated in god's way under his leadership and authority and rule for real and coming out of religion apostate lukewarm because it's going to be cast out in the end it would be now before judgment massive rolls in it would be now folks so he wants me to start breaking down the book of Isaiah because it's quite timely from what he's been telling me according to what he would like to unroll as to what, why, when, where, and how all of this is going to be taking place anyway with judgments and woe coming to man. Woe is perilous and tumultuous times, folks. It's tribulatory, which means great shaking. It is what tribulation means, shaking. And so there's great shaking coming to mankind because mankind has been walking in drunkenness and whoredom while saying that they believe in God. They believe in the Messiah. They believe in the Holy Spirit and plan to go home to him, but they will not come out of the harlot tree living that they're living. We have people who are purporting to speak for God and are under the influence of drugs and alcohol and pornography and adultery in their marriages. And I could go on and on, folks, and it's hidden. And we are giving our tithes and our offerings and our money to these people who will not live separated, disciplined under the Lord and his authority, cleaned up and consecrated sacred to him. It horrifies me. If I could tell you the amount of tumultuous stomach anxiety feelings over what I have seen in the past two weeks behind the scenes public and private and they're not coming out to repent publicly folks they're going to try to hide this stuff for as long as they can get away with it and what cr crushes my actual person is i can hear from god judgment is coming and it's coming to the house of god and the leadership first because from the leadership tumbles down a cascade to the pew sitting people so folks, if we are tied to drunkenness and harlotry in the pulpits, 
it is going to affect your lives if you sit in the pew and you listen and you partake in this. I cannot handle that. Within my person, within my stomach, within my soul, I cannot handle that. So I am coming out with God to speak on the truth of the matters of his body. His body is sick, he's been telling me. So I sit here with my fire crackling sounds on while I speak to you about these things because I am crushed in my spirit in many ways. And the attacks on the real cleaned up folk, the attacks, the warfare attacks from the enemy through apostate Christians themselves is incredible right now. And from the spirit realm, the ones without bodies that are slinging their lies and their leading and counsel into our minds and our hearts. Depression is heavy on people right now. He warned me hopelessness was coming on New Year's Eve, the first day going into the first day going into this year. He warned me that that was coming for people in 2023. So, folks, I cannot express to you the heaviness of what is going on right now in the lives of those who are willing and are living separate away from the world and divorcing all of the world's ways and leadings and struggling at that right now to walk proper with God and the ones who are not willing to come out from the harlotry and the drunkenness, which is really, folks, being led by demonic spirits. The ones that will not come out of that are about to face the hand of the Lord because there's only so much time before he lays down a judgment decree, which actually just segued us right into Isaiah chapter one. And that is what he's wanting me to break down. And um, I wrote this with him yesterday. And um, as I reflected on the entire weekend, because this is the weekend everyone has been celebrating Passover with him and his resurrection, I do that on a regular basis, but I sat with him yesterday writing Isaiah 1, and I'm like, I'm not coming out with this today. (laughs) I'll bring this out tomorrow on Monday, but it is heavy, and it is timely, and it is what is on his heart and what is on his mind, and it's for good reason because we have a lot of people who are currently on the broad path and perishing, and yet they will tell you that they know the living God, and they can quote scripture because they've memorized it, and they know the truth, but the truth is unable to set them free because they will not come out of the whoredoms and the drunkenness. So... With that, I'm going to go into this heavy, weighty word from Isaiah and the Lord as he's quoting him in the vision that he had the the one-on-one with God. So I'm going to be doing what I believe is going to be a series in a playlist called the book of Isaiah. And it will be on YouTube. And he's going to be going through this for quite some time. The Zoom meetings will be based around, general based around discipleship. Because that's, that's what needs to be happening. Discipline and discipleship. Following the authority and the lead of the Lord. So with that, folks, I am going to pause for one moment here. And I will be right back.
there was a hum on one of my speakers and it was irritating me. So excuse me for that. Isaiah chapter one. This is the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. The meaning of the names listed in the first verse right there, Isaiah, Yah has saved, Amos, strong, Judah, celebrated, Jerusalem, founded in peace, Uzziah, the strength of Yah, Jotham, Jehovah is perfect, Ahaz, per possessor, Hezekiah, strengthened of Yah. Now let's put these all in a statement, just the names of the people and the tribes that were spoken of. Yah has saved strongly and is celebrated and founded in peace by the strength of Yah. Yehovah is perfect and possessor strengthened by Yah, celebrated. Folks, I find that fascinating that that's the meanings of just the names and the tribes, the places. Incredible to me. I like doing this as it usually has a great statement God is making just in reciting the meaning of the people, tribes, and places that are partaking in the books. I don't always do that, folks, but sometimes he comes over me and I'm like, let's see what this one says. I like that. Yah has saved strongly and is celebrated and he is founded in peace by the strength of Yah. Jehovah is perfect and possessor, strengthened by Yah and celebrated. Verse 2, hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows his owner, and the ass is master's crib, but Israel does not know. My people do not consider. It is incredibly sad when the first thing spoken to a prophet in a vision from the Lord is that God has nourished or provided for and blessed his people, but they have forsaken him and followed the way of Satan, despite all the blessing, love, and provision. And he equates them to animals who know their place and the hand that feeds them and is loyal, but not his people. He says they regard him not. We have this going on in the world even yet and in great magnitude, a people who claim his name, celebrate feast days, recite the words, but do not live with, by or in accordance to his authority over their lives with honoring him upon the doorposts and threshold of their hearts. They seek him not with a whole heart and dedication in their lives and when we have gone the way of honoring the stuff over God himself and we disregard his person, we will see the result of taking the high king's stuff and dishonoring the king himself. Verse four, ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children who are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They have gone away backward. God just said, these are a people of lawlessness toward me. They are continuing in trespasses against me, my ways and person, and they honor me not nor regard me. They are a people of the seed of Satan. They are corrupt people who corrupt other people with their ways and conduct conduct that is in opposition to me. They are my enemies. They have provoked me to anger for they have gone backward away from me, not in reconciliations to me, in estrangement from me. When we are regarding others, stuff, happenings, provisions, giftings, followings, acceptance, and the likes, more than and instead of the Holy One, our Creator and God, we have another God. And the Holy One is disregarded, disrespected, and another has taken up the place of him within man. Man has been found to exalt another God within, namely self, just like Satan. And in that they have fallen from the grace of God and have fallen into the trappings of the satanic way of self-exaltation. When one exalts self, they have successfully dethroned God within their heart. 
verse 5. Why should you be stricken anymore? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faint. He just said, why should you be reprimanded any longer? It will not help you. You will just revolt more and more regardless for your whole head or leadership among you is sick. Your whole heart is weak or troubled and sick. That's the Strong's Concordance definition, folks. Toward God and resolute character, upholding God and his ways. It's really bad when God says he's not going to reprimand or correct them any longer. What is worse than his correction? His judgment, his gavel decree to lay down the law of sow and reap one's harvest they gave to God. And I'd actually like to make a correction here. He's actually not saying that he's not going to correct them. He, they're saying, why, like, why should we be stricken anymore, God? And he's like, because you're going to revolt more and more. So his judgment is his corrections and reprimand coming in. Do we understand when we speak of harvest and reaping what we have sown, it is what we gave God of our lives for him to sow another crop for us with? We understand that. He told me long ago, sow the right way with me now and we will reap a great harvest later for it is what you have given back to me for our next crop season's reaping of yields. So when we do not regard God the right way and deeds of conduct, we sow a harvest we will not want to reap, but one we will because it is what we gave back to him to sow for our next yield or crop reaping. And I am reminded right now that the people who are living hidden lives in leadership right now to God because it is heavy over me right now. You are, giving, you, are, you are about to walk right smack into God's judgment because you are leading his little ones into perdition. You are destroying the lives of his little ones because they are tied to your iniquity. If ministry and followers and money and people and exaltation of your own self in life is more important than those sitting in the pews, he's going to remove you. And the heaviness of the weight of that is incredible to me. There are going to be people who die in pulpits preaching. Folks, if you look up the thief comes to steal, yada, yada, it talks about the thief being false teachers of doctrine in pulpits. It go, the, the breakdown is incredible. What is more, more of a false teacher, folks? And please excuse my interjection here, but what is more false leading than somebody who claims something and lives completely another or takes the very truth and makes excuse and twists it, takes scripture and twists it to accommodate for man's worldly ways, which are satanic and fallen. God is not going to let you remain in these leadership roles while you're perverting his house. Because in his house are his little ones and he is very defensive over his innocent little ones. Being led by wolves and apostate, hypocritical, devouring pulpit microphone preaching teachers folks he's not going to have it so let me read that again so when we do not regard god the right way and deeds of conduct we sow a harvest we will not want to reap but one we will because it is what we gave back to him to sow for our next yield, the hidden things you give to him, what you do in secret with God, he will purport publicly. If you're loving on him and in good intimacy relationship with him privately, everyone's going to know it because he is going to be present and over your life in a bigger move than just an anointing or giftings. The very presence of God will go with you. He will flow from all his gifts right out of you. 
all of his wisdom and counsel will come right out of you to his baby children because that's his will and good pleasure. But if you are living a secret life purported one way publicly and hiding your shame and your guilt behind closed doors as if the holy living God cannot see you himself and you refuse to come out of those ways and you refuse to repent, then you are thereby forfeiting and disregarding the grace of salvation itself. What are you saved from if you're walking in those ways? You've been saved from nothing. You need the cleansing of God. You need him to sanctify you. Because he's not, he's not living out of a vessel like that. That ain't him in there. It's another antichrist comes in to purport himself like God. He knows a lot of stuff about God, but you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't come under discipline of God and he doesn't come under his authority or his lead. And that is what we have out there in leadership right now, folks. So as flawed as I may be, folks, I am giving everything I possibly can behind closed doors to be right with God, weeding out one transgression against him after another, wherever he points them out, one lie after another, wherever he points them out. And by the strength and the grace of God, I can do all things through him. By the grace and the strength and the mercies and the love of God, he keeps me alive day after day. We're either going to come under the leadership and authority of the holy God in our lives for real and live disciplined lives with him here, forsaking, which means turning our backs on and walking away from everything the world says is normal and good and you should be doing. And it's okay and gives excuse for that Satan's way. Satan's way is to give excuses. Well, you can, you can do this because, or it's all right. Like, like people will understand. People may be understanding, but that God may be understanding why things are happening, why you're doing certain things, but he still wants you to come out of that because in some way it's killing you. And if you stay in those iniquitous ways, which are lawlessness against the way he conducts himself and leads his own kingdom, if you remain lawless against his kingdom, you will, you will not be coming in because he's not going to have offenders. That's why Satan's kicked out. He kept offending and he didn't want to stop offending God. Because in, in Christ, stepping into him, living life right smack out of him and his person and how he conducts himself, we are more than capable and strengthened in him to take care of anything that needs to be taken care of in our lives. It's a struggle. It's not easy. You fight every day. Overcomers are overcomers for a reason because they had a battle to overcome it. It wasn't easy. He told you in this life, you'll have tribulation, which is shaking. It, you will be shaken up because you're trying not to live as the world or as Satan's fallen ways with his fallen people and their ideas of what is all right. Because in the end, they are lulled right now and they're going to walk right off that precipice into perdition, right off that broad path that was so easy to follow and made their flesh feel good. And then they're going to burn forever with him. He loves that. Those are his trophies. Don't be a trophy of Satan in hell. Don't be estranged from your living God. Death is, is estrangement, folks. It's not about your body that is going to expire at some point. It's just a vehicle. It's just a body of a vehicle. You're not going to expire. In some fashion, you will exist for all of eternity. It's just that if you're going to be dead for all of eternity, you're going to be in hell, which is estrangement. Death is estrangement from God. It's estrangement from his way, his person, his conduct, and his kingdom, which is his place. It's out of relationship with God. I digress. Let us get back into this. When we so disrespect, dishonor, disregard, and lawlessness toward conducting ourselves, living in sin and transgressing his nature, whilst he has blessed us, loved on us, and provided for us, he has but one course he can take to shake us up, to see the error of our ways. That's Satan's way within and toward God. Judgment. And reaping what one sowed. Do we understand this is what Satan did toward God before we were ever created? Satan knew God. Received God's blessings, giftings, and provisions. His stuff. But he did not want to be under him, love him, or honor him and his ways. He wanted to go his own way. And with that, when we follow in his footsteps and lead, guess what we get? Judgment. Judgment of that sowing. 
as we yield the crop of rebellion to God holy, we receive what we gave back to him back upon ourselves. What does one get when they rebel, dishonor, disrespect, and transgress and challenge God Almighty, holy and true? Well, what did Satan get? Separation from God, kicked out of his presence and his domain and punishment. I believe we ought to learn and learn wholeheartedly from his example. Satan thought it fun to transgress God in his way because he was beautiful, blessed, gifted, and smart in his own eyes. Folks, we are a lot of things too because God made us in his image and he is beautiful, blessed, gifted, and wise. But without him, we are vile dust, transgressing, and sinful. We ought to recall the fear of the Lord. This is Satan's failure along with self-will, which is to say self-desire and self-good pleasure. That pulled him away from honoring God holy and led him down the path of self pursuits rebellion to having a god over him and into perdition this is what he is saying israel's going through this is spiritual israel folks this is the family of god and why she will reap the harvest of judgment and this is the very reason that judgment comes over and over and over again in scripture and in the tribes blatant disrespect dishonor and rebellion to god holy verse six from the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up nor mollified with ointment. And their transgressions and sickness within that he just spoke of have no soundness in them from their feet to their heads. Do we know what soundness is like in animals? When a horse is deemed sound, it is well off, whether their feet or their temperament sound is sound, and sound is well off in good condition. So when we hear God say they don't have a sound part to them whatsoever, he is saying they are completely corrupted and altogether unwell, as he goes on to say they are wounded, bruised, and putrefying with oozing sores. This is all symbolic spiritual folks. Putrefying means oozing with defilement, dripping freshly with corruption in the strongs. They are, in his eyes, disgusting and completely do not look, sound, or act like him and are ultra disrespectful and resemble his enemy and his ways, Satan. Not good, not good at all, and bringing judgment upon themselves. Do we know why God brings judgment and not correction at some point? And and, and technically, he's telling me judgment is correction, but it, it's just the heavy dose of it lumped into a one big sum because his little corrections or disciplines were not heeded. So do we know why God brings judgment? His mercy it's because of his mercy. If he doesn't bring the judgment, nothing will shake them from Satan's counsel and leadership in their lives. And they will all perish with Satan as they will all be cast away from God. His mercy comes with every judgment to shake his people to their senses, to see the error of their ways and their blatant disrespect, dishonor, selfishness, and vile defilements. Verse 7. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence. And it's desolate as overthrown by them. There are consequences of becoming God's enemy instead of his beloved and obedient children. We have been speaking for quite some time about the need for obedience and discipline of persons unto God. And this book of Isaiah is a great example of why and what happens when we don't. And what God says about disobedient, disrespectful, selfish, transgressing people. For one, our country will be become desolate. The meaning of desolate is astonishingly laid to waste as defined by Strong's. And in that, our cities will be burned with fire and strangers or people from another land, creed, and culture will devour it in our presence. Folks, that means we will see firsthand. Another country overrun our own cities will burn and our entire nation will be laid waste, pillaged and plundered, overthrown. 
This is exactly what we have coming in God's judgment once again, and is exactly what his prophets have been warning us is coming for quite some time. Eventually, after some time of warnings like prophets of old, it took years and years sometimes, but eventually the prophecy arrived. It took Yeshua quite some time, quite some years to come and fulfill the prophecy about himself. Judgment will come, and with it, God's mercy to shake up the people once more under repentance and to return to him before it's too late. Verse 8. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage and a vineyard, as a lodge and a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. When he says daughter of, he means offspring, the future of. So when he says Zion, that is the place of the holy people of God. And in this case, the people who are supposed to be the holy people of God have gone out of the way and they are corrupted, vile in transgressions against the Holy One, as noted by the verses above. And in being so, his people and their future has become like a cottage and a vineyard or a lodge and a garden of cucumbers. Now, oh, why would he say this? Have you ever tried to have a dwelling smack dab in the center of vines untamed and wild or a dwelling in the middle of a cucumber patch as their vines too? It would be unkempt and overtaken by the unruly vines. This is what has happened to God's people. Because they kept not the ways of God, the husbandman, the vine dresser himself, their dwelling or tabernacling with God has become unruly and out of the way, rebellious, out of control, and it is choking out the habitation or the tabernacling with God in proper standing with him. She has overgrown herself and taken over. That is rebellion and disrespect and dishonor. Class 101, Satan's way, lead, and results. And the husbandman, the vine dresser, out of dishonor and disrespect for him, has vacated the premises. Verse 9. Except or unless the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like Gomorrah. Here Isaiah is saying, except by the tremendous grace of God for leaving us a remnant of people to survive this, who still serve him, we would have and should have been like the result of Sodom and Gomorrah. But folks, they burned to the ground, everyone, and it died. At least they, through the prophet of God, Isaiah, have one leader, one head who has not gone to his head and stays low, humble, and obedient unto the Lord and with him, a gracious and small remnant whom God has chosen. Or else God would destroy them entirely, as he did Sodom and Gomorrah, who would not live with God holy, nor under his leadership either, because he's holy, folks. Sodom and Gomorrah's biggest thing was they were perverted and twisted and defiled beyond measure, would not live like God. They wanted sexual perversion and drunkenness and stealing. They wanted the defiled worldly life of pleasure, pleasure, pleasure to whatever your sinful nature wanted. But the difference being a tiny amount of folks in Israel this time remained loyal to God, bringing in his judgment, but unto but, but not unto annihilation entirely, as in Sodom and Gomorrah. So he's not going to completely annihilate Israel this time like Sodom and Gomorrah, but, but he could have. He might have, should have, because he's equating it as being just that bad. But, but, but because Sodom and Gomorrah had no one in their living totally right unto God. Lot had to be dragged out of there with his family and they didn't even all return because some of them turned back in their hearts wanting that lifestyle and way. But now there is a remnant small amount of people who are still serving God. So they're not going to be entirely annihilated. We need to learn from these stories, folks. That's the God of the Bible. This is our father and his way. He is not going to bring into his kingdom any lawlessness, period. That is transgressing his person and the way he conducts himself. We're either seedlings of his, as in children of his, for real, 
in this life or we are not. And this life is the only proving ground we have to prove to him and he to prove to us one way or the other by the witness of the Holy Spirit, which side of this fence we lie on. Verse 10, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ear unto the law of your God, you people of Gomorrah. He's equating them just as bad. Why is Isaiah and God saying this to Israel as they are not Sodom and Gomorrah? Because God nearly equates them to the same, for really they are, except a few small in number. When we are as like Sodom and Gomorrah, judgment will come. It is coming to Babylon once again, as it did in old. And if it were not but for the elect in her, the time of judgment would last longer than it will, God declares. That is the mercy of God unto a rebellious and idolatrous people. The time of judgment is cut short, not the judgment itself. And it's all for the remnant of those who serve the Lord without fail or corruption under obedience, sanctified, clean, and consecrated unto him in his person and his ways, folks. His leadership. Being the father who seated them in their ways. We have this coming in judgment of the Lord and judgment of the Lord shall fall upon the nations once again. And for the elect's sake who serve the Lord, the time will be cut shorter. Verse 11. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, says the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts. And I delight not in the blood of bullocks or the lambs or of he goats. He just said, you can offer and sacrifice to me, but your doings are a stench in my nostrils. I abhor them as they are the offerings of the fallen. He takes no delight in these people, nor what they are offering him, for they are offering him idols. When we have animals and live unholy, animals that are for sacrifice unto the Lord God, for a sin offering and a sweet savor, burnt offering unto the Lord, we, but we have been living vilely before him, corrupted in all our ways. The sacrifices and offerings that have, have now become defiled as well, and God abhors them altogether. The offerings and sacrifices are rejected just as the people are in their defilement and transgressions against God. It is seen by the eyes and perspective of God as Satan giving God holy an offering. This happened before with Abel and Cain. One was a holy, wholehearted sacrifice and giving back unto the Lord God truthfully. And the other was not unto the Lord God in heart stands upright and was corrupt within and so was found unacceptable to the Lord. Verse 12. When you come to appear before me, who has required this at your hand to tread my courts. Strong's is walk abusively against. So let's read that again. When you come to appear before me, who has required this at your hand to tread my courts or walk abusively against my courts, bring no more vain oblations, incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Here he is stating, you all come before me and tread unworthily, abusively, my rule, place, and person, and bring offerings and oblations for your sins. This is an abomination to me. Your new, mo your new moons, feasts, and times, Sabbaths, holy days, as set apart for God, and your gatherings together, I cannot even with you all. I cannot even stand any of this in my sight. It is all lawlessness and transgressions against me, even and especially your holy assembling. Ouch, y'all, that is heavy. And we ought to hear God out on how serious it is to him to not reverence him in the ways he requires of his children, but to walk claiming we do honor him. Hypocrisy does not stand with God and hypocrisy is defilement. To walk contrary to what one claims is hypocrisy. And hypocrisy is lukewarm, compromised, and has mixed with Satan's seed, as God said in the beginning of this chapter in book of Isaiah. Verse 14. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They are trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. Folks, the whole point we have these feasts or festivals and celebrations is to honor God. And he's like, yo, I can't even with this right now. I hate this. I hate what you're doing. And I don't even want to bear it or partake in it. Wow. 
Okay, the feasts are the festivals and the celebrations of the Lord God holy, but when God's people are transgressing him, his leadership in their lives, his ways, and have become defiled by Satan and his counsel and ways, God hates our hypocritical honoring of him. Meaning, y'all don't really honor me. Y'all walk however you please. Your will is your pleasure and you walk in it. My soul, and that's God's thoughts and hearts and actions, hates this. My very person, soul, and heart are grieved beyond your understanding. It troubles me so, and I have wearied to bear them or suffer them any longer. When God says our celebrations that are supposed to be about honoring him are done in hypocrisy, he hates our holy day celebrations and has grown weary of them altogether. Hate in the definition of, of, of the, the, the um, dictionary is passionate dislike of. God passionately dislikes the holy day feasts, festivals, new moon times and seasons of holy days when we live in hypocrisy and rebellion to him and his ways. And why wouldn't he? It's literally looking someone in the eye and lying to them. Verse 15. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Yes, when you make many prayers, I will not hear you. Your hands are full of blood. Now, when a people like this pray, God refuses to hear their supplications. And not only that, he will hide himself from these people and not even look upon them anymore. When they pray profusely, he will still ignore them and turn away from them because their hands or deeds are full of blood. Blood, defilement, murderous ways, not honoring, life-giving ways, but ways leading to the grave as they are in a death covenant with Satan. Verse 16 and 17. Wash yourselves, make yourselves clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Here God begins to reason with them and explain their error. Go wash your hands of these ways in which you transgress my person and conduct. Go make yourself sanctified, cleaned up, and consecrate yourselves unto me again. Stop your evil ways. Cease to do them. Go learn how to do good. Live right. Go learn good judgment, good conduct and character, and start making good decisions. And start by relieving the oppressed in whom you walk by and think nothing of. Go find the widows and the fatherless and serve them as I would. This is huge, folks. He desires to correct those he loves. He wouldn't waste his time instructing them once again as in how to be or even reiterated if he totally did not want them to reconcile with him. Reconcile means to come back and under him. Come back to him. Come back under him. Live as one in union or agreement. Instructions, commands, and explaining oneself to his children is God extending mercy, love, and hope. Hope that they will return to him and come out of Satan and his ways. Verse 18, 19, and 20. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Although your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He's telling them just how disgustingly bad they are behaving and transgressing his way. Like as red as red can be, your blood is defiled. Your ways, your conduct, your covenant relationship with him. Because blood is a sacrifice. It's supposed to be holy. If, see it's conditional. So all that where he said, your sins may be as scarlet, but they'll be as white as snow or they're like crimson, but they'll be like wool. If conditional prerequisite, you be willing and obedient. This is why he will continue to talk about discipleship, discipline, obedience, and actually living right with God, in God, with God, as one with God. If you will be willing and obedient, then you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with the sword or the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. It is his mercy and love that sets out to instruct and correct as he attempts to once again lead his people. But here he states prerequisites and a proper protocol that must be adhered to in order for God to forgive them or dismiss the charges. 
He states, you must be willing and obedient to reform yourselves and fall under my command and leadership again. If not, you will not eat of the good of the land, but instead you will be devoured by the sword. The Lord has spoken it, which means decreed it. Uh, as a kingdom, high king, judgment, a call, a decree. Don't forget the sword of the Lord is his mouth, word, and decree or rule or decree of rule. They will die because he has decreed it as such. He has declared it by his all high rule and they will be cast out in death or estrangement from him. That is God's way and rule. Because these are all choices people are making, free will choices. We ought to think about why we do things and who we are really following. Are we doing whatever we want in our daily lives too, like the Israelites here? Or are we living honest lives with God holy in truth and in obedience to him under discipline of his spirit over us? Because if not, we walk the way of the rebellious, disrespectful, dishonoring, hypocritical Israelites here who followed Satan and will reap that harvest of what they sowed. He doesn't expect us to be flawless or without any mistakes, but God does expect accountability, effort, and honor. We ought to walk this life with him. We ought to walk this with him in life and thereby bring to our father the fruits of his spirit in our lives, becoming like him in his ways. Because in that we honor, revere, and please him as we have chosen to resemble him and become his seedlings once again. Truly his children, the children of the most high and holy God. Holiness is his character. It is upright and proper. We are to be too, or we are not his seedlings and we have chosen another way. Verse 21 through 23. How the faithful city has become a harlot. It was full of judgment. Righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loves gifts and follows after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither does the, the cause of the widow come unto them. When he says the faithful city has become a harlot, he speaks of the people of this place, having gone and followed Satan, his ways, and perverted the walk and life with God holy in covenant marriage. He states these people had good judgment and righteousness at one time, but now they are murderers. Now this is likely literal, but before all material world things play out, one becomes a murderer at heart long before they do it in the physical realm in deeds to the flesh persons. He says their silver is worthless and their wine diluted. This is spiritually saying, you were vessels of honor to me once as silver is and stands for justice, but now you are a waste material. You were once a fine wine to me, beautiful and robust in our covenanted marriage, but now you are lukewarm and disgusting, perverse, compromised, watered down and defiled in our relationship. You honor devils and speak smooth words to me on your feast days, but regard me not in your hearts of or, or obedience. You reverence me not in truth. That is hard to hear, folks. Hard to hear for it breaks my heart for God and for the clueless people of what they are truly doing. When one follows lukewarm compromised living whilst claiming they love God, he said how to love him. If you love me, obey my commands and commandments are ways lead in protocol. He said this for a reason. If we do not, we truly are not his at all. Verse 24, 25, and 26. Therefore says the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel. Ah, I'll ease myself of my adversaries and avenge myself of my enemies. Folks, these are the people, his people he's speaking of. I will turn my hand upon you and purely purge away your dross and take away all your tin. And I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. And afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. He just said the Lord of hosts, the Lord of heaven's army. There's a reason he's saying that the mighty one will ease himself. And that means loose himself of his adversaries. Again, he's speaking of this hypocritical and defiled people and avenge myself of my enemies. 
That means he sees these rebellious, disrespectful, disobedient people as his enemy, and he's setting himself against them. And to turn his hand upon them is not only his rule and judgment, but his power and shaking. And that hand upon them is for good reason to purge them purely at that, he said, or shake them from their complacency to be hypocrites, lukewarm, defiled, and corrupted from his way in person. It is for reconciliation that we go through judgment. It is not for punishment or hardship alone. It is to encourage us of several truths and getting the understanding of them. We went astray. We became defiled. We became apostate, lukewarm, and hypocritical. We walked away from God wholly truthfully, and we became estranged in our marriage to him. Adulterous. And if we continue this way, we will follow Satan to hell in the lake of fire where we all are estranged ones of God holy. That's where they go. To purge away your dross or our dross is to burn in refining judgment fires the wasteful living and lives and turn us to proper standing with the Lord God holy and to recall just who he is and how he is to be reverenced. To take away our tin is to take away the weakness of the people. Tin is a very weak metal, a lesser metal, easily compromised. And he will restore, that is a word for reconciliation, folks. He will restore judges. That means he's going to lay down the law again, folks. Just living just, as in justice. Just living and just people to uphold the law. Number one counselors or ones who will walk in his holy ways and will counsel others in them will be restored as well like it was established in the beginning when his people were walking and living upright before and with the lord and he tells me right now that's what he's doing he's going to throw down these hypocritical drunken apostate unsanctified leaders or that have set themselves in some sort of a leadership role right now without going through the purification process of refinement and sanctification. And not only that consecration, which means making God number one in their lives and are hiding secrets and leading the people astray and into perdition like a wolf. And then, and then afterwards, you will then be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Folks, I don't know if you even see the gravity of that last decree. He just said, after all my judgments befall you and I purge you of your ways thoroughly, removing your weaknesses and marriage bed defilement by restoring to you proper judge, judges and judgment and counselors who will uphold my ways in person, then I will call you the people who know righteousness again, who are faithful in marriage to me. Whoa, we ought to really hear what the spirit is saying and showing here. Verse 27, Zion shall be redeemed with judgment and her converts with righteousness. He's so disgusted, so wroth with his people that he has called them his enemy and he hates their ways as well as not calling them his children. But instead, those who will come with him again, those who will uphold his ways and return to him must first be called converts. That is not accident that it's in here, folks, as he draws the understanding that they have perverted from the path and the way of the Lord and now must be returned to him and them, thereby needing reformation to be reformed or converted again. This is stating they are full seed of Satan now and need to be reseeded in his ways and under his lead and authority again. This is heavy and clear as to what happens to lukewarm, hypocritical, apostate, smooth word talking, but far from truthful, loyal, and honestly living with God holy as their God people. Judgment made God's judgment made God's enemy and massive shaking, burning, and reformation will come to these people. That is what happens to this kind of person who claims to run with God holy, but brings shame to his name and how they are truly living defiling the marriage covenant with him and purporting opposite folks purporting that they're totally good with God and this is the word of God himself given to Isaiah in his vision and interactions with God we must know the God of the Bible truthfully and according to the Bible or we have made our own God of our own design and not according to scripture 
And if we do that, we will not go to the God of the Bible when this is all said and done because we believed on him not as he told and showed himself to be in scripture. We cannot form our own image of God. He warned us of this as he said, many will come in my name. Many messiahs. This means many different ways to view and define the God of the Bible according to man. And Messiah means anointed savior, savior, the anointed one who came to save. You can't have many of those, like many definitions. There's one, there's one, one, one that came, one, that's it. And yet there is only one truth about the God of the Bible. He is a person, one God. Not many definitions of him based on what delights man. One truth, one spirit, one God. And man better get to know him in truth as he defines himself thoroughly throughout scripture and to his people. And man had better learn to reverence him, honoring him the way he said to through obedience and making him one's God and Lord over them. Verse 28. And the destruction of the transgressors and of the sinners shall be together and they who forsake the Lord shall be consumed. This is pretty clearly stated here. Destruction is coming for sinners and transgressors of God and his ways. And they who forget God forsake all he is, his character, honoring him, obeying him and returning to him in his image shall be consumed. Definition consumed per Strong's ended, cease, be finished, perish, destroy utterly, expire, rid, waste and take away. That's what's going to happen to those people. That's estrangement. That's death, y'all. God will do this to those who claim him, but truly walk another way. Those are his enemies. Verse 29. For they shall be ashamed of the oaks which you have desired, and you shall be confounded for the gardens that you have chosen. Many times when oaks are mentioned in scripture, it is referencing people. So here he would be saying, you will be ashamed of the people and their ways in which you followed and took pleasure in and became defiled by. Because someone taught them this rebellion. And the garden is the, the marriage bed of God and man, where they are to be a couple inside, not a place where the marriage is defiled and one has strayed into a spiritual adultery following Satan and his ways and people's ways. The garden they have chosen or the intimacy with Satan's ways that they have chosen will bring them shame as it has already brought shame to God in bed with them, in bed with another. Verse 30. For you shall be as an oak whose leaf fades and as a garden that has no water. That's no prosperity and dried up no life. And, straw, and the strong shall be as tow, and the maker of it as a spark, and they shall both burn together, and none shall quench them. The strong shall be as tow means tossed and shaken, brought low and diminished, and the maker of it as a spark, meaning the strong will burn up easily like a spark to a flame, and no one will stop it. Folks, we really need to heed what the Lord is speaking about dishonoring him, being in disobedience to him and his person and his way by living in hypocrisy or lukewarm, saying one thing or purporting holiness in our activities publicly or proclaimed, but behind closed doors and hearts living a sham and defiling the marriage bed of the Lord. Truly just saying one thing with our mouths, words, proclamations, Bible verse memorations or teachings, but not living it as living epistle love letters of the relationship of God and man in union for real leads to God's judgment upon lives. We cannot defile the hidden bed of the Lord where he sees all and not expect judgment to fall upon us. For it isn't his laws or precedents we are only breaking. It's our marriage and his heart. He is a person and has feelings, especially when he's been cheated on. And we ought to understand he sees all and he has since before the foundations. His eyes are searching to and fro in the earth, looking for real faith in him. Folks, that means really loyalty to him. For what is it to be faithful? Loyal. Fidelity to the marriage union. This is an obedient child of God, a child who loves him his way by obeying him and his leadership in their lives. The book of Isaiah starts out strong in judgment of a wicked and rebellious people. And he said to me, it's a timely book, Janet, which means it's pertinent to, to today and this people today. 
That's a really scary thought for those walking in hypocrisy, excuses, and disobedience, loving him not in their disobeying of his commands. That rocks me to my core just to know. I cannot imagine what all this, what all is coming in judgments, but we have the beginning of understanding when we read this chapter. And he did say in Proverbs 9, 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. It's time we gain knowledge of the Holy One again. And that means get to know him for real. And that begins with reverencing him, which is honoring him, obeying him and being seated in his ways. And folks, you have to be reading scripture to even get to know him first at all. And that is the beginning of wisdom, just the beginning requirements of walking wisely in God, with God, as God said to reverence and obedience go together and disobedience and irreverence comes with reaping a judgment of fire, destruction, wasting, estrangement, shaking and consumption of those people. This is the God of the Bible, and we ought to learn him, know him, and revere him. And that is all we have written today, folks. This is a very long video already, but I cannot express to you the heaviness of judgment that is coming, that God is speaking, and it's due to all of the defilement of his people that are walking in whoredoms, which is spiritual adultery against them, which means really walking the way of the world, uh, doing whatever they want, making excuses for it, and not living clean or sanctified or consecrated unto God in drunkenness. Why do I keep adding in drunkenness? It can literally mean drunken as in alcoholism. But I mean drunkenness with the ways of the world intoxicated and allured by them and, and, and making place for them in their lives, continuing in the sin, which is continued sin is iniquity. And iniquity is what was wrong with Lucifer in the beginning, why he fell. You were perfect in all your ways until iniquity was found in you. So folks, when we continue in his way, which is iniquity, which is continued sinning, you are not seated after the Father, nor under his leadership and authority or rule. You are not cleaned up and sanctified, nor consecrated unto him, which means you made him sacred, number one high ruler in your life, and to be in, in accordance to and under his authority and his rule in your life, being conformed to his image again. That's salvation. Salvation is being reconciled to your God, which means oh, we was estranged. I was going a different way, and I would like to take your hand again, sir. Nope, I'm going to come under your rule. I'm going to come under your leadership. What you say goes, period. I want to return to you. I was defiled and dirty and filthy and the devil had his claws in me and I need help getting his claws out of me and I need you to take my hand to do that. That is reconciliation. That is the purpose of salvation. And folks, judgment is coming to his house. If it hasn't already begun, it is, it is coming in great, great, great measure. Will it trickle down to the pew sitting people who are not living right? Absolutely. But you know where he's going to start in correction of his leadership? Because the chief wants or the head is altogether sick, as he said in here. When the head is sick, the rest of the body gets sick too. Now, Yeshua, God, Jesus Christ's head, he's the head of the church, the head of the body, his body of believers. He's not sick. So you will not be sick. In following him either or your ways and will be cleaned up and you will be righteous and you won't be making excuses living in defilement or drunkenness if you actually come under his head or his leadership, him being chief, him being Lord over you. He did say you have to accept him as Lord and Savior, folks. Savior is just what he did. That's his role. That was his role to come and make the way for you. Lord means you're going to come under his leadership and way now. Making him your savior and Lord and God. I guess I'm really heavy over this because I know, I know, I know there are going to be people who are going to be reaping really, really not awesome harvests. And it's breaking my heart now before I ever see it coming. I mean, in the physical, I see it coming in the spiritual. It's like there's these little scrolls that are being handed out over what has been decreed over them by the judge himself with a gavel decree. Because they are refusing him, because they have upheld the covenant not, which is the marriage. They're now upholding the marriage for real inside. 
They're taking money from people to live a funky lifestyle behind closed doors. They are not repenting of it, uh, not turning from it to God or to them, not coming clean. This is Babylon. This is the harlot's way of defilements and drunkenness. Drunken by the allure of it. No, I can, I can really, I can really be partaking in cheating on my wife, or I can really be partaking in pornography or or illicit drugs and alcohol behind the scenes. I can be stealing money from the church and no one is going to know. And yet I will purport myself to be clean before the people in the pews. Folks, he sees all of that. And his judgment's coming because the folks are sitting in the pews being led by someone like that. And whether they know it or not, folks, when you're under people of hypocrisy, you become hypocritical living people as well. Spiritually, your spirit knows what's going on and you become people who make excuse because the guy at the pulpit says you can. And because that appeals to your flesh, you do. You become tin and weakened and compromised easily. He ain't going to have it because he wants to save you all. But first, he's got to bring a spanking and a correction and a judgment to his leadership because the head is altogether sick. I digress, sir. This is very long already, but I pray that everybody gets the gravity of this message. And it is a very heavy one to bring on a Monday following recognition, remembrance, and recalling of your Passover. Because what is Passover anyway, God? It's where you came as the living tabernacle and high priest and lamb sacrifice slaughtered perfectly over the altar, which has the tablets or the word of God underneath it and the testimony thereof. You walked out the old covenant perfectly, perfectly for us to give us a way back to you. So really Passover is coming out of that bondage old way and coming into taking God's hand and living right with him again. That is what this Passover was all about. That is what resurrection day and your, your crucifixion is all about. It ain't going into the really, really pretty luscious land with all of the grapes and the honey and the milk that flows from it, all the provisions and the loveliness. It was taking your hand again. I pray we all take your hand again in marriage and become a faithful people, a faithful city, a righteous people. Being faithful with fidelity to our marriage covenant to you and uphold the covenants or outside of defilement, outside of drunkenness and whoredoms of idols and carnal living. And I pray this in your son's holy and precious name, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Christ. Amen.